Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And the first set of questions are on culture and external affairs. Um, I regret to note that question number one, Ken McIntosh, uh, Mr McIntosh, doesn't appear to be in the chamber. So I call question number two, John Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is taking forward cultural initiatives relating to the Scottish diaspora. And Minister Hamza Youssef. Uh, it is estimated that up to 50 million people across the globe uh, can claim Scottish ancestry. The Scottish Government supports a range of activities that recognises the social, cultural, intellectual and economic benefits diaspora engagement brings for Scotland and all Scots. John Wilson. I thank the Minister for his response. Whilst noting the good work with regards to the Scottish diaspora tapestry, can the Minister identify what more it intends to do in terms of its future work programme with regards to the Scottish diaspora within North America? Minister. I thank the member for the question and uh, quite rightly he notes the tapestry which uh, has uh, various links to, to North America as he mentions in his question. For 2014 specifically, the Scottish Government representatives in Canada uh, and the United States continued to work with vital partners, uh, Team Scotland partners that include, uh, for example, Visit Scotland and our national touring companies to promote and deliver uh, year-round programmes of public diplomacy, cultural activities, targeting specifically the Scottish diaspora. Uh, these include, of course, for next year, the homecoming programme, uh, which has ancestry and creativity as two of the key themes of the year. But then, of course, a huge year in terms of uh, the interest for uh, friends and diaspora in the United States in regards to the Ryder Cup, and, of course, uh, for Canada in regards to the Commonwealth Games. Uh, our continued focus as well on Burns and St Andrew's Day, as well as, indeed, Scotland Week. So I can assure the member there's lots of targeted uh, promotion to diaspora in that part of the world, and I'm sure it will yield uh, excellent benefits. Thank you. Question number three, Jamie Hepburn. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with Creative Scotland regarding the establishment of a film and TV studio for Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislip. Uh, I established a film delivery group to take forward examination of the possibilities for private sector-led development of screen production facilities in Scotland. Uh, since the group was established at the end of May, Sunny and Sony and Left Bank Productions have made significant productions in converting an industrial space in Cumbernauld for screen production and have been shooting a major new television series there, Outlander, based on the novel of Jacobite Scotland by Diana Gabaldon. Uh, Scottish Enterprise, on behalf of the group, has commissioned a full consultancy study by ECOS Limited on possibilities for further expanding screen production facilities, and this will inform future action. Jamie Hepburn. I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for her answer. She refers to the studio that has been established in my constituency, and I'm aware that other sites are in the running for a, a long-term studio for Scotland. But given that the studio has been established, in Cumbernauld, given the good connections to the rest of the country uh, from that location, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the, that location will be looked upon favourably? Cabinet Secretary. Well, clearly the examination and the report will be published uh, in the new year and we'll have an indication of the, the longer term uh, proposals. In the short term, I'm very pleased to see that the Cumbernauld facility is being used and in terms of uh, the work that's uh, been undertaken there in converting the Isola building, uh, it is very impressive and I'm sure will be a key consideration as part of the report when it's published. Many thanks. Question number four, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met the Board of Scottish Opera and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government regularly meets with Scottish Opera to discuss a range of issues, including the delivery of Government grant objectives, its assessment of progress, reflecting also independent critical opinion and its future plans. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. In, in recent months, obviously, there's been some concern expressed in the uh, media about whether the strategic direction uh, of Scottish Opera is both coherent and transparent, especially in the context of the public funding that you refer to. In particular, concerns have been raised about the fact that all other uh, national opera countries in Europe have either a full-time chorus or a full-time orchestra, or in many cases both. Does the Cabinet sh Secretary share the concerns that have been expressed, especially which relate to Scottish Opera's ability in the future to attract the biggest names in international opera? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm pleased to, to report that the progress in uh, recruiting a, a new music director uh, is 
uh, progressing well. Uh, it's a very important post that will help inform the strategic direction. I think that's clearly important in terms of the question that Liz Smith asks. Uh, but also in terms of uh, full-time orchestra, full-time uh, chorus, there are different models that are out there in terms of uh, international uh, op operation. Glenbourne, for example, uh, operates in a different way than some of the national uh, companies that she's referred to in other countries. Um, I do think it's important that Scottish Opera serves the needs of Scotland, and that's where the combination of both large-scale uh, production but small-scale as well. We need to make sure that we have productions that can reach all parts of Scotland. But the key point I think Elizabeth is making is the importance of uh, the strategic direction of Scottish Opera. I, I, she, is, in her question, I think is making it quite clear she expects the board to take a keen interest in it. Uh, so do I, and I'll make sure that that view is communicated to them. Thank you. Question number five, Kenneth Gibson. To ask the Scottish Government what the purpose was of the Cabinet Secretary for Culture and External Affairs' recent visit to Denmark and Sweden. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Heslop. Uh, my visits to Denmark and Sweden between the 8th and 9th of December were aimed at deepening links with both countries and exploring areas for further cooperation. In Copenhagen, I met uh, Danish partners in the fields of architecture and culture, including representatives from the Culture Ministry, sharing information, for example, on Scotland's national youth arts strategy, Time to Shine, and our recently launched architecture policy, Changing Places. I spoke with leading uh, Danish practitioners in architecture about how we might associate our own agenda for cities with work they have been doing on improving livability and the Nordic Cities Network. In southern Sweden, I delivered a lecture to an international audience at Lund University on Scotland's place in the EU, where the academics and students showed significant interest in and asked informed questions about the Scottish Government's views on cooperating with the Nordic countries, Scotland's place in the EU and the role an independent Scotland would play in the world. Thank you. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for a comprehensive answer. Can she advise the Chamber as to what further steps the Scottish Government will take to strengthen ties with our Scandinavian neighbours? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, in terms of our existing cooperation, they're extensive and we're very keen to develop new areas. Uh, currently, in terms of maritime affairs, cities, social policies, energy, research and innovation and tourism, these are all areas that we can build on in the future. We're also looking particularly opportunities to cooperate with the Nordic countries on competitive funding in the EU, including on Horizon 2020, um, the programme for research and innovation, connecting Europe, uh, promoting connections in energy, transport and digital life, uh, supporting action on the environment and climate change, and of course, as I discussed at my meetings last week, Creative Europe, cross-border and transnational uh, uh, programmes involving students and other matters. Thank you. Question number six, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the benefits will be of Scotland hosting the International Cultural Summit in 2014. Uh, Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, holding the Edinburgh International Culture Summit 2014 will position Scotland as a, a world leader uh, for international debate on the role and value of culture and further emphasise Scotland's international profile. The 2012 summit has already enhanced awareness of Scotland's creativity and cultural reputation, as well as of Edinburgh and its festivals, developing both local and international profile and the uh, potential for future international partnerships. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the acclaim following the 2012 summit, which resulted in new funding partnerships among 37 of the countries present. How will the Scottish Government be working with partners such as the British Council to ensure that 2014 offers similar opportunities? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I'm delighted that the Scottish Parliament has agreed to become one of the partners and again to host uh, the Culture Summit. It will take place in August 2014. Uh, there are huge opportunities both in internationally but also uh, between partners on a bilateral basis. I, I was particularly keen about the relationships that we've been building with South Africa with fantastic uh, uh, performances uh, displayed here at the Edinburgh Festivals but also opportunities for longer term uh, uh, partnerships. Brazil, for example, are holding the next World Cup and the next Olympics and they're very interested in the Inter uh, Edinburgh International Festivals and how they can uh, use that type of um, development there in terms of um, their uh, cultural uh, aspects uh, surrounding these great sporting uh, occasions and of course with the Commonwealth Games and the fantastic cultural programme that will accompany that we really have something to offer in exchange of knowledge and experience. Thank you. Question number seven, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government what support is available to touring exhibitions. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. 
Uh, the Scottish Government supports touring exhibitions in a number of ways, including provision of indemnity cover through the Government Indemnity Scheme, uh, direct financial support for our national collections and through Scottish Government funded grant schemes administered by Museum Galleries Scotland and Creative Scotland. Clay Baker. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. Uh, the queues of people that were outside the Parliament to see the Great Tapestry of Scotland shows what a fantastic project that was. And I'm pleased to see it's about to go on tour, and that's why I'm calling for the tapestry to come to Fife. And I would suggest the new refurbished Kirkcaldy Galleries has been an ideal venue for them. Um, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what analysis the Scottish Government has made of the economic benefit that this type of touring exhibition can bring to a local economy, and how much they contribute to local arts programmes? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think the uh, celebration of the tapestry uh, is something to be commended. I have met with the organisers to discuss both the short term, the long term and more permanent uh, facilities for the tapestry. But I think the excitement that's been generated throughout the country uh, in terms of the, the, uh, the, the distribution of the tapestry, some of it will be in its entirety. Quite often I think it will have to be sections of it. In particular, telling the stories of the local economy is something to be celebrated. But it does bring people in. I think if we were to do the best economic analysis, the question probably should be asked at the next opportunity of the corporate body, because I understand the department itself has done some kind of assessment as to the benefits of having as up to about 30,000 people coming to, to this place to see the tapestry. Obviously, that has a great input, impact and boost for the local economy, and I will see if there are any studies about the impacts of touring exhibitions or local exhibitions and the economic impact and share that with the member. But I would encourage her to contact uh, the, uh, the team behind the diaspora to invite them to come to Kirkcaldy, but obviously she'll need to work with her local authority partners and others. And obviously the refurbished um, Kirkcaldy uh, facilities, I think, uh, would be ideal for such a such, such, such a venture. But it's not for me to decide. Thank you very much. Question number eight from Stuart Maxwell has been uh, withdrawn, and a satisfactory explanation has been provided for that. So I turn to question number nine, Mike Mackenzie. To ask the Scottish Government what the benefits will be of the University of Edinburgh Centre for Cultural Relations. Cabinet Secretary, if you uh, I'd first like to take this opportunity to congratulate the University of Edinburgh on the successful opening of the Centre for Cultural Relations. Uh, there will be real benefits to Scotland in having a Centre for Cultural Relations. Uh, firstly, its research work will help to inform the development and focus of the Scottish Government's international work. Secondly, through its teaching activities, including a Master's in International Affairs, the Centre will increase the number of post graduates in Scotland with an international perspective. And thirdly, the centre will be a strong position to undertake a programme of public events, helping policymakers, businesses, students and people around the world to better understand cultural relations. Thank you. Mike McKenzie. I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And uh, um, I wonder if she agrees that in a country like Scotland that's renowned for its international cultural festivals, the establishment of the University of Edinburgh Centre for Cultural Relations sends a further message right across the world that Scotland's an outward-looking nation seeking to better understand how culture and education deepen relations between countries. Cabinet uh, I, I completely agree with that sentiment. I mean, Scotland is uh, renowned uh, for its culture and its, its ed education. It's a great opportunity, I think, to broadcast that. And in terms of, of engagement, it does show Scotland as an outward-looking nation. And these were precisely the issues I was discussing with the French culture minister uh, on Monday when I was in Paris, but also in reinforcing the education agreement that had been signed by the First Minister just a few months ago. Many thanks. Question number 10, Michael McMahon. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the BBC in relation to its proposals for public service broadcasting as outlined in the White Paper on Independence. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, the Scottish Government is in regular contact with representatives of the BBC to discuss a range of broadcasting issues in Scotland. On the 26th of November, the First Minister wrote personally to Lord Hall, uh, BBC Director General, enclosing a copy of Scotland's Future, Your Guide to an Independent Scotland. The Scottish Government has always been and remains ready to discuss these matters with the BBC. Uh, obviously, th these would be discussions conducted in a quite separate context from the BBC's important role as an impartial broadcast reporting the referendum and I have regularly set out the distinction with the BBC. Uh, to date the BBC has not accepted that invitation on the grounds that they fear any such discussions would compromise their impartiality. Indeed at the Salford Media Festival where I recently gave a keynote address, Ian Small of the BBC specifically said that if the BBC was to hold a position or be seen publicly to hold a position on a constitutional issue, which is effectively that broadcasting is part of the referendum, then that could be seen as colouring their impartiality 
relative to reporting on the referendum. Michael McMahon. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her uh, response, which uh, was very uh, comprehensive and actually explained uh, partly some of the reasons why I was asking the question today, because although she will contend that the White Paper covers all of the answers uh, to the questions that are posed around public service broadcasting, should we ever uh, have the misfortune of uh, becoming independent Scotland in the near future. Um, there has to be more detail, and we can only have that detail if there's ongoing dialogue with the BBC. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell us uh, if she's going to and how she's going to keep the Parliament up updated uh, as we move towards September the 18th next year? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, in, in terms of uh, information, I'm delighted that he recognises that uh, the White Paper and Scotland's Future is a, a great step forward in terms of providing information that's available. But he's quite correct in, in saying it's not unreasonable that people will want to pursue uh, certain issues. And I think that we're now in a stage that in, in terms of setting out what is possible, we've set out what is possible, we've set out what we as a Scottish Government would like to see in terms of joint venture with the BBC, but also a Scottish broadcasting company that will be able to reflect uh, Scotland to itself and expand and, and better use the licence fee that's paid by uh, the Scottish viewer. But it's really important that in the constitutional context, if people expect uh, there to be dialogue and uh, discussion, that has to be encouraged by the UK government. And if Ed Vasey and uh, the DCMS uh, would indicate a, a willingness to start that discussion, we would do it now. Many thanks. That concludes questions on culture and external affairs, and we now move to questions on infrastructure, investment and cities. Question number one, Alison Johnston. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the Living Streets campaign, give us time to cross. Minister Keith Bray. The uh, Scotland's Road Safety Framework to 2020 sets out the Government's commitment to pedestrian road safety, including the needs of children, the elderly and the disabled. And we support the aims of the Give Us Time to Cross campaign, although the legislation itself is reserved and implementation is for local authorities. Alison Johnston. Um, I thank the Minister for his response and also for the 20 mile per hour pilots he announced earlier this week. And I look forward to the publication of the Government's walking strategy next year. Um, research has shown that three quarters of people over 65 have trouble crossing the road in the time currently allotted. Scotland's record on pedestrian safety is poor and we urgently need new research into why this is the case and how best to improve the situation. Uh, will the Minister commit to bring forward such research and will he work with Living Streets and other organisations to do everything within his power to put people, not motorised traffic, at the heart of street design and what actions will the Minister take in the short term to bring about this much-needed culture change? Minister. Well, Alison Johnson's already mentioned one of the measures, including the 20 mile an hour pilots, which we've announced for the trunk road network, uh, quite a, a radical departure from previous practice. And these, could have, these pilots could have seriously uh, significant benefits for both uh, pedestrians and for cyclists and other vulnerable road users at the same time as calming the traffic in some small towns which are bisected by the trunk road network. But in addition to that, we do provide guidance to local authorities, and in particular, the puffin crossings, which um, the member will be aware of, do have a, a, a technology which allows uh, the, to, to be taken into account the length of time someone will take to cross the road. Whilst they're still actively crossing it, then the lights will stay at red. And I think we've uh, said uh, from now on uh, that, all, along with the UK government, all new technology for crossings the, uh, that supersedes the previous pedestrian crossings will have this technology, which will help people in the circumstance which the member mentions. And over and above that, as the member has also mentioned, uh, the national walking strategy will come forward in March uh, next year or in the spring next year and we'll work uh, from that basis to make sure we have further measures to include and improve upon safety for pedestrians. Uh, Dennis Robertson, supplementary request. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, many constituents uh, get in touch with me, uh, Minister, regarding the audible crossing and the, the time the, or the length of time of the audible crossing. And as a blind person myself, I'm aware that I could be halfway across the road when the signal stops. That may give me some cause for anxiety. But um, it, what I would be asking the minister is, can we review the time allocated for the audible signal to try and ensure that people can get from one uh, pavement to the next without the signal stopping? Minister. 
I think the issue that uh, is raised by Dennis Robertson is very similar to the one that's identified by Living Streets in relation to elderly people being given enough time to cross at pedestrian crossings. Uh, again, as I say, it's a reserved issue where uh, the DFT could change their guidelines uh, and the national standards which apply, although it is within the gift of local authorities to change timings on pedestrian crossings to suit circumstances or users. Uh, and the Scottish Government, for our part, to answer the point by uh, Dennis Robertson, is that we provided further guidance which is detailed in the Good Practice Guide. So this does give the authorities the power and the guidance to take the measures which he suggests. Briefly, Alec Johnson. The Minister has to some extent covered the issue, but given that local authorities have uh, some discretion on how these are applied, is it possible that we in Scotland might achieve the objective simply by lobbying our local authorities to increase the time available for crossing? Minister. It is to the extent that the local authorities have that power already. It does come as a surprise to some people that uh, pedestrian crossings are reserved, um, and who knows what the reasons for that are. But uh, there is a degree of discretion within local authorities, and I think Alec Johnson quite rightly says, where it's within the power of a local authority to change it, and also where they have the technology to do that, then changes can be made which would help the situations described both by Alison Johnson and Dennis Robertson, and local people should take up those opportunities. Thank you. Question number two, Graeme Day. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the report, the effectiveness of the rail network across Great Britain, a comparative analysis. Minister Keith Brown. We welcome the findings of the independent Better Transport campaign report, uh, showing further evidence that despite the Westminster budget cuts which we have to work under, we are driving forward the economic growth and competitiveness of Scotland. Uh, our commitment to invest in our railway infrastructure and services has delivered real benefits, with Scotland's performance outstripping many other parts of the UK. I thank the Minister for that answer. Indeed, the, the report notes that Rail in Scotland receives a high level of financial support from the Scottish Government and is delivering high quality and growing services as a result. But it goes on to acknowledge the challenge faced in maintaining those performance levels in the face of budgetary pressures. Can the Minister outline the scale of threat that would be posed rail services in Scotland in the event of a no vote next September, given, if that happened, a £4 billion budget cut would be coming down the track from Westminster? Minister. Well, I think it's worth pointing out, as I've mentioned in my initial response, that despite the Westminster cuts which we've currently suffer, uh, suffered from, this Government is committed to a record programme of investment in rail, supporting new and better services, stations and trains, and allowing us to do everything possible to keep fares down. And the impact of this programme is clear, with passenger numbers increasing to record levels over 83 million journeys last year alone and higher levels of passenger satisfaction. It shows what can be achieved through devolution where decisions are taken locally for the benefit of passengers in Scotland. But the current Railways Act constrain our ambitions and we could do much more. An independent Scotland would have greater flexibility over the decisions and budgets to structure and support the efficient delivery of rail services in Scotland. And of course, in this context, presiding officer, we have had the announcement yesterday from the ONS, the Office of National Stats, that there is to be a reclassification of network rail. And it would be useful to give the assurance to the member that we have propose no change to the current levels of investment that we have. They should not be uh, uh, circumscribed by any changes which are made by the ONS, and it's our intention to see the same levels of uh, investment either maintained or improved in future. Thank you. Question number three, Chick Brody. Thank you, President. Also, to ask the Scottish Government what action Scotland's ports are taking regarding clean marine fuel requirements and how this fits into a Scottish ports strategy. Minister Keith Brown. The Scottish Government is in regular contact with Scottish ports on a range of issues and I will be engaging with the ports as well as shipping industries and others to examine the impacts of the new controls on sulphur in marine fuel at a conference which I have convened to be held here in Edinburgh on the 15th of January. We would expect uh, ports to be aligning any actions that they may take with a national marine plan and where appropriate the national planning framework. Jake Brody. I thank the uh, Minister for his answer. There will be 26.2 billion euros decided for allotment within the month, within the month in the European Parliament for the trans-European networks for transport. Some of this fund will be made available to develop 85 ports in the core European network to address clean marine fuel requirements. Will the Minister uh, insist the UK Government, as current Member State, makes immediate representation on Scotland's behalf, which thus far it has clearly failed to do again? Minister. 
Well, I would provide the reassurance to the member that we will continue to work with the ports and shipping industry to maximise the opportunities for any funding that becomes available to help address any requirements in relation to marine fuels or indeed any other issues. As the member is aware, the criteria for the network was set at the EU level, although we have worked hard to ensure a case was made to increase the number of Scottish ports included in the wider comprehensive network. The most recent call for 10T funding was announced on the 11th of December, and Transport Scotland officials are already encouraging ports to bring forward proposals for funding where they meet the criteria on either the core or the comprehensive networks. Thank you. Question number four, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle fuel poverty. Cabinet Secretary Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, the Government is committed to eradicating fuel poverty and we have invested £220 million on fuel poverty and energy efficiency programmes since 2009 with an estimated total net saving to household incomes over the lifetime of the measures of more than £1 billion. However, we believe we need the full powers of independence to tackle all of the causes of fuel poverty. If elected in an independent Scotland, the Government has indicated that we would move the costs associated with eco and the warm homes discount from levies on consumer bills to central resources. That would cut energy bills by roughly £70 a year and would allow a new means of funding and delivering energy efficiency improvements to Scottish homes that would be both fairer and better suited to Scottish circumstances and needs. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response? Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that the recent fuel poverty figures do not take account of the energy price increases from the last quarter of 2012, or indeed the eye-watering energy price increases in 2013? Would she therefore agree that the level of fuel poverty is higher by almost 200,000 households than the ones she specified in her report? And on that basis, does the Cabinet Secretary believe that her government will fulfil the commitment to end fuel poverty by 2016, which we across this chamber agreed without qualification. Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I thank Jackie Bailey for her questions. Uh, she refers to the latest statistics, and you know, clearly I can uh, provide the detail that's in those statistics. It shows that fuel poverty declined between 2011 and 2012, uh, yet 27.1 per cent of households, according to those statistics, are still estimated to be fuel, fuel poor. And Jackie Bailey is absolutely right. Uh, rises in energy costs uh, in the latter part of uh, this year uh, will further undermine our efforts through our energy efficiency programmes to reduce to the point of eradication fuel poverty. Uh, I can give Jackie Bailey an absolute assurance that this government will do everything within our power to meet that objective that is shared across this chamber of eradicating fuel poverty. I would simply say to Jackie Bailey that it would help us in doing so if we had control over all of the causes of fuel poverty and not just some of the causes of fuel poverty. Because what we're seeing is that we are investing in energy efficiency, but much of that effort is being undermined by rises in energy costs. It would be far better for this parliament to have its hands on all of the levers so that we could much more quickly and more effectively tackle and eradicate the fuel poverty that all of us condemn unreservedly. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On 11 October, I officially launched Citrus Energy, a unique and innovative social enterprise developed by Cunningham Housing Association and backed by the SNP Government and Big Lottery to provide free and partial assistance for tenants, homeowners and businesses, helping them to switch to a much cheaper energy supplier. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that such initiatives can help households make substantial savings on the energy bills and therefore help to reduce fuel poverty? Cabinet Secretary. I am aware of uh, the initiative Citrus Energy that Kenny Gibson refers to, I do believe that initiatives like that one, combined with the activity of the National Home Energy Scotland hotline and the substantial good work of the energy advice centres, are really important in helping people improve the energy efficiency of their homes and manage their fuel bills better, although I would refer back to the answer I gave to Jackie Bailey earlier. I would certainly encourage all households in Scotland to get uh, the free impartial advice from experts like the Home Energy Scotland hotline or indeed Citrus Energy about what support is available to them, uh, including the support available from the Scottish Government funded Home Energy Efficiency Programmes for Scotland. Claire Baker. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary outline whether there is an impact of what the implications are of the UK Government's revisions of the energy company obligation on the delivery of Scotland's climate change targets and the fuel poverty targets? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as the member is uh, undoubtedly aware, uh, DEC will be consulting on changes to ECO early in 2014. Uh, the fine detail of the impact of changes are still unclear. We are currently working 
to clarify the implications of these proposed changes on Scottish Government programmes in order to ensure that the impact on Scottish households is minimised. Uh, I'm happy to keep the Chamber updated on that as we get more details, but I would refer back to comments I made earlier on. If we had full control over these matters, then we could more sensibly uh, fund and arrange uh, energy efficiency programmes, taking the pressure off of household bills while enabling us to put in place programmes that were more efficient to administer uh, and more suited to the needs and circumstances of Scotland. And again, you know, that is why we make the argument that Scotland should be independent in this area to allow us to do that so much better. Thank you. Question number five, Bob Doris. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what information is available concerning the use of discretionary housing payments in Glasgow to mitigate the effects of the so-called bedroom tax. Minister Margaret Burgess. The Scottish Government has allocated £3.5 million to Glasgow City Council this year to supplement funding from the UK Government for discretionary housing payments. It is the responsibility of Glasgow City Council and all local authorities to ensure that this funding is directed to those most in need, in most in need of financial support. No information is currently held by the Scottish Government on the use of discretionary housing payments. The Scottish Government has no functions in relation to the administration of the discretionary housing payment scheme, which is the responsibility of the Department of Work for Work and Pensions. Bob Doris. I thank the Minister for that answer. Can I advise the Minister that some anecdotal information is emerging that in Glasgow initial short-term awards for discretionary payments are on application for extension being reduced or refused by, the, by those processing claims? This is also deterring some of my constituents from appealing those decisions in case they lose even further in this case. Uh, in asking this question, Minister, there is no direct criticism of Glasgow City Council. This is a difficult issue for everyone to deal with. But can I ask the Minister that if she will take steps to support Glasgow City Council in ensuring a greater consistency in the use of discretionary payments awarded in the city to ensure the most vulnerable people that I represent do not lose out? Minister. It is up to each local authority how long to award a discretionary payment housing payment for in line with the DWP guidance and there's no set time limits and the award will depend on the individual circumstances of each claimant. But as a result of the additional £20 million provided by the Scottish Government, Scottish local authorities have £35 million to spend on discretionary housing payments this financial year, which should allow councils to uh, award payments for a longer period of time uh, for those that are struggling. And I would encourage anyone um, who is in need of assistance to continue to apply for a discretionary housing payment and to ask for a reconsideration if they believe um, that the, the wrong decision has been made. They should ask for that to be reconsidered and they should not be frightened to do so. Mary Fee. Thank you, President Officer. At the Scottish Affairs Committee this week, Citizens Advice Scotland stated that DHPs were an insufficient means of tackling the bedroom tax because there is no uniformity as to how DHPs are awarded. Whilst the bedroom tax is a heinous piece of legislation, no local authority has issued guidelines on the awarding of DHPs. Will the government publish bl blanket guidelines to ensure that people across Scotland are being treated equally and fairly? Minister. Uh, as I said in my previous comments, uh, discretionary housing payments are a reserved matter and the administration of them is up to the Department of Work and Pensions. It would not be appropriate for the Scottish Government to give guidance on a reserved matter. Um, the Scottish Government has given £20 million to local authorities to ensure that they can top up their discretionary housing payments to the maximum allowed and that to ensure that all the most vulnerable people uh, can get uh, help where it is most required. Question number six, Hans Ali Malik. Uh, good afternoon, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what stakeholders have contacted the Minister for Housing and Welfare regarding the White Paper on Independence. Minister Margaret Burgess. Okay. I have not been contacted by stakeholders regarding the White Paper. All the key housing and regeneration welfare stakeholders were contacted by either myself or a senior official on the 20, 26th of November following the publication of Scotland's Future. Hans Ali Malik. Thank you very much for that response. Um, as the Minister stated on the 4th of the 12th, 13th, that the Minister was very busy speaking to stake stakeholders and listening to their uh, concerns and taking action. The fact that the Minister hasn't actually brought anything to the Chamber with the people of Scotland who are homeless, overcrowded and in poor housing assume that all these issues are a figment of their imagination and everything is hunky-dory. Minister. 
Uh, no, uh, what I, I said uh, previously in the previous debate was that I was out discussing with stakeholders the Scottish Government's vision uh, for housing in Scotland and where we are arriving with that in our target for meeting our targets for affordable housing, which we are um, well on target to meet. I also said that stakeholders, we've taken the views of stakeholders and board in terms of developing all our strategies and policies. And also, I have spoken to stakeholders regarding, um, the, the, since the white paper has been published, I contacted them. So it's not true to say that the Scottish Government is not out and about uh, and discussing with, with stakeholders and also our homelessness commitment that we've met as well. All of that was mentioned in the previous debate, uh, which we had here a uh, fortnight ago. Thank you. Question number seven, Maureen Watt. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the devolution of air passenger duty would have on the economy and the integration of modes of transport. Minister Keith Brown. A, a reduction in air passenger duty will allow Scotland's airports to be more competitive in attracting new direct air routes and will also improve our international connectivity. In a study by York Aviation in October 2012, it was found that by 2016, £210 million less per annum will be spent in Scotland by inbound visitors than if APD had not risen as it has since 2007. As set out in Scotland's future, this government would prioritise a 50% reduction in APD within the first term of an independent Scottish Parliament with a view to eventual abolition of the tax when public finances allow. Thank you, Maureen Ward. I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, can he give an estimate to the cost to the North East and the Scottish economy? He said it was 210 to the whole Scottish economy. Can he give an estimate of what that means to the North East as a result of air passenger duty? Minister. Uh, well, uh, figures specific to the North East and to the Scottish economies are not available. A report by PwC earlier this year projected that the abolition of APD would lead to the UK economy rising by about £16 billion between 2013 and 2015. That would be larger than it would otherwise have been under the current APD regime. In addition, such a rise in output could lead to the creation of around 60,000 jobs between now and 2020. A brief supplementary and a brief answer, please, James Kelly. Uh, in terms of the impact of airports on the Scottish economy, it is a matter of some surprise that the Scottish Government have not been to the Chamber since the decision to... Uh, to purchase Presswick Airport. Will the Minister commit to coming to the Chamber early in the new year to discuss the Government's business plan and the implications of that purchase for the Scottish Budget? Minister. The Deputy First Minister has already given a commitment to uh, make sure that Parliament is updated as we move forward with the Presswick uh, uh, purchase. Can I just say that I thought that James Kelly was going to apologise for the fact that the Calman Commission four years ago committed to reducing APD and have done nothing since then. In fact, we've had nothing from the Unionist parties who all subscribe. Well, the question is actually about APD, so that's what I'm trying to answer. Please I thought don't. We had some more from Excuse the me, Minister. To can we please not have questions and answers across the Chamber? Everything through the Chair, please. Uh, apologies, President Officer. So I would have thought that the Unionist Party would have come forward to explain why, since they all supported uh, APD being devolved to Scotland and the Calman Commission, they've had very little to say about that ever since. Question number eight, Elaine Murray. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what impact the decrease in new social housing completions will have on housing supply. And Minister Margaret Burgess. From April 2011 to, to, to September 2013, we have delivered 11,937 social rented homes. This is well over halfway to meeting our five-year target of 20,000 homes for social renting. These homes will provide secure, affordable housing for those who need it most, and I commend all councils and housing associations for working, working with us to maximise the number of homes built during this period. Thank you. Elaine Murray. Uh, thank you, but that may be so, Minister, but housing, social housing completions are down 14% on last year and housing association and cooperatives completions are down 25% on the previous year. What are the Scottish Government going to do, in the words of the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, to get the affordable housing supply programme back on track? Minister. As I said in my previous answer, we are well on target to meet our 30,000 uh, affordable homes by the lifetime of this Parliament. And the Scottish Government recently took action in increasing the subsidy to social landlords uh, and, and local authorities to ensure that we could meet this target. And that was on the advice of the, 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 the stakeholder group that we set up, taking their advice and in the figure that they proposed to us. And they tell us that they can now uh, continue developing and the target will be met. 
I can call question nine if we have brief questions and brief answers. So question nine, Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it can provide an update regarding the infrastructure, the broadband infrastructure in Aberdeenshire. Cabinet Secretary Nicholas Sturgeon. Uh, Aberdeenshire Council is a major investor in the Step Change programme and a key partner in the Scottish Government's uh, delivery team. Aberdeenshire is one of the areas in which survey work is currently being undertaken, which is a vital step in the delivery of next generation broadband. It's not possible to confirm the specific areas that will receive upgraded infrastructure until these surveys have been completed, but the Government intends to announce the first exchanges to be upgraded in the rest of Scotland area in early 2014. In the meantime, the high-level deployment maps are available to view on the Scotland Superfast website. Thank you. Dennis yeah, I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that response. The Cabinet Secretary is very much aware that in Aberdeenshire West I have some remote and rural areas. Uh, what alternatives will there be for constituents who can't actually be connected through the BT broadband system? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I certainly appreciate the uh, geography that Dennis uh, Robertson is talking about. In areas where fibre broadband is not going to be an option, the project will explore the use of other broadband technologies, such as wireless satellite and advanced copper, to provide faster broadband. Uh, the funding for this is included within the existing project budget, and I'm happy to provide Dennis Robertson with more details. Many thanks. That concludes question time, and we now turn to the next item of business. I'll allow a few seconds for ministers and front bench members to change seats. And the next item of business is a debate on motion number 8610 in the name of Fergus Ewing on the Bank Corruptcy and Debt Advice.